problems every day, and we need solutions, we need answers, and the Word is full of it. And the book of Proverbs is wisdom, and we're all in need of wisdom, aren't we? Amen. So um, we're going through the book of Proverbs all the way up to the ninth chapter, and now we're going to kind of tackle Proverbs by topic. So there's certain topics throughout Proverbs that have many verses, so we're going to kind of combine those verses together and deal with certain issues, and hopefully those, as we deal with those issues, like I said, you know, the Holy Spirit is bringing all things into subjection. But it first starts with us. And so there's areas in our life that need to be subjection, under subjection of Christ. And as we gain the truth, the lies are exposed, and now we apply the truth, and in that area, it's now under the subjection of Christ. Amen? So the first one, I actually shared this on a Sunday morning, but I'm going to share it again because it was meant for Wednesday night. But it's on anger, because I think that's just a topic that a lot of us deal with quite often, is the issue of anger. And so what is Proverbs? Yes. How many of us make that face quite often? So it says there, a gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. When we like to be able to always give a gentle answer, no matter how intense the situation is. So let's gain some wisdom from Proverbs regarding anger. And this will be dealing with verse 14, I mean chapter 14, 29, 15, 1, 22, 24, 29, verse 22, and chapter 30, verse 33. So it's embarrassing to have to apologize to someone for getting angry when we later find out we did not have complete understanding of the situation. So we've all been there before, haven't we? We lost it, and we later find out that what we lost it about, we were completely wrong about. We didn't see the situation right. Proverbs 14.29 says, People with understanding, that's key, control their anger. People with understanding. The reason we, we have a problem with our anger is because of a lack of understanding. We're often misled. We often see a situation through a blind eye because of hurt and pain of our past. So we're, we're blinded in certain areas. And so how we see things can be completely from a bad perception. So it's not wrong to be angry it's not wrong to be angry. It's what we do when angry that is right or wrong. So initially, we may always get angry, but the thing is, what do we do when we have that initial anger stirs up inside? Do we just release it, or do we take a step back, cast our issue upon the Lord, and hear from Him, and then respond? So to have understanding means not being quick to judge, but taking time to listen to God who knows and sees all and will reveal to us what is really going on so that we don't wrongfully judge and so we know how to respond in a godly manner. We gotta understand that we have the spirit of God in us, the spirit of God that hovers all over the world, the spirit of God that is how can we know the mind of God? Through the Spirit of God. How can we even know the mind of others? Through the Spirit of God when needed. We have the discerning of spirits. So we, we need to learn how to tap into this more often, don't we? And all it takes is acknowledgement. If we acknowledge God in every given situation, He has wisdom for us. He has understanding for us. We don't have to be seeing things wrong. We can see it right. But we have to discipline our flesh to just stop, look, and listen before we respond to anything. The reason some cannot control their anger is because of unresolved issues. When someone says or does something that resembles the unresolved issue, and again, it can be just resembles it, the button is hit and we go off. How many of us can say we have a button? We have an area that if somebody gets close, goes off. 
You have any kind of device that's really uh, sensitive that you just get near it and it, you know, I'm trying to think of what kind of device does that, but there's devices that you just get near it and it goes off. Or alarms on a car or whatever it may be. You know, we have those things. And God wants us to get to a place and Holy Spirit can take us there where all the buttons are gone. He's taken off all our buttons. We don't have any unresolved issues left in our life. That's the ultimate goal. I'm going to be teaching about this in a few weeks on God's love. To really gain the fullness of his love, we got to let everything go. And so that is the most peaceful place we can be is when nobody can say or do anything and we're not moved. No matter what somebody says or what do they do, we're not moved. We're not shaken. That's what it means to be strong in battle. For those who are soldiers, strong in battle means you're not moved, you're not shaken. No matter what, that's what boot camp, that's what everything is to prepare you for, is so that when you're in battle, you're not moved or shaken. That's God's work in us to get us to that place so that he can entrust us with anything. So when God is in control, our emotions are in control. When God is in control, our emotions are in control. And when tested... We respond to problems with a soft answer that, again, turns away wrath rather than grievous words that stir up anger. I've been doing real well in this area, but as of yesterday, I made a mistake. I decided to, what was in my mind, I'm going to speak it out. And though... My wife and I are at a way better place than what we used to be. And we dealt with it way, you know, it wasn't even that big of a deal. But honest to God, we hardly ever fight. So whatever little fight there was, it could have been avoided. All I had to do was keep my mouth shut. But I just had to say one little thing. And I could have had a much more peaceful night. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's it. For as it says in Proverbs 29, 22, a man of wrath stirs up strife and a man given to anger commits and causes much transgression. Before that, I forgot to read this, it's dangerous to be friends with hotheads. Having to walk on your toes, always afraid of saying or doing something that sets them off. It's wise to avoid friends such as this for it will lead to nothing but unnecessary turmoil. Now, it doesn't mean that you avoid, because every one of us have issues. But some people don't want to change and are not willing to even go down that road of change. And those are the people we've got to avoid. There's people that are hotheads, but they desire to change. And they're willing to go with us. We can take them along the road, but we've got to just have the discernment. You know what? We can't help everybody. And some people are not at that place yet. And all we can do is pray for them. So if you want to avoid a life filled with strife, free yourself from your own resolved issues by repenting, seeking out forgiveness, and avoiding being friends with those who have not. Wisdom, right? Okay, we're going to deal with another heavy issue, and this is about borrowing or debt, which I think a lot of us Americans have a problem with. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So as God's children, we don't have to be under the systems of this world. This world has systems. And there's an elite that rules those systems. But we, as God's children, don't have to be under it because we're under greater authority. We're under a higher power. Our rulership is in heaven. We, don't even co- we come from another planet. We're ambassadors in this world. So we're not under the subjection of the nation we're in. We're under the subjection of the nation that we came from. The kingdom that we came from, heaven. So debt is one of the main factors in the rich holding power over the poor. The elite of this world, most of them are bank owners. Banks are not created to help the poor. They're created so that the rich can get richer. 
So it doesn't mean you don't have a bank account, but just be wise. Be very, very wise. Now that we're not of the world, we should not be fooled. We should be able to see through the tactics of the enemy. Psalms 23 says we are no longer in want. Therefore, if we are content with what God has provided right now, we should only get loans and credit cards in a needs-only basis. If we're content with what God has given us, and we don't need anything more because God is all we need, and the lot that he's provided for us, then we really don't need to get no loan. Unless, you know, some may feel getting a house and certain things are okay. But others may feel to never get a loan or credit card, credit card at all. Okay, the Financial Peace University teaches that, just to have no credit cards. Can people live with that? People are living without credit cards. Am I one of them? No. <laughs> But people are. But I, my wife is very good. And we have very little credit cards. And we're trying to reduce our credit to basically just our mortgage. Bottom line is debt holds people back from the freedom of using their full resources for the purpose of God. And there's a lot of people in church who really can't do much of anything because of debt. We should put our security in Christ and Christ alone. When we are in debt to another, they hold our security in their hands, and that is not a safe place to be. Do we want to be in our creditor's hands or in God's hands? God. Amen. <laughs> Until our debt is paid, we are just a borrower, and therefore the creditor, creditor can take from us what is rightfully not our own. Now imagine in some of the nations over the last few years, the economy has crumbled, and when somebody had their money in the bank, when they went to get it, they couldn't. That's what happens when we're borrowing, when the banks own all that we have. They can seize it. They can take it. So we need to use wisdom. As it says in Romans 13, 8, owe nothing to no one but to love them. So the little possible that we owe, the better, except for love, loving people. Amen. 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 And now let's deal with bribery. Not something often talked about, but I got a lot out of this. Proverbs 17, 23 says, A wicked man accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the ways of justice. Isn't it, how many of you have gotten out of trouble before because someone you knew gave you a break? Anybody? Yep, that's good. It's good to have, you know, parents might be a teacher, family members, this, that, or whatever. You get yourself out of a mess because of somebody you know. Yes, so that's true. Many of us have that. But is it fair? Of course not. It's not right to be treated un equally from others. Okay, I'm just talking about what Proverbs says. God is a God of law and justice. Those who do wrong must pay the penalty. Yes, spiritually, through what Jesus has done, we are forgiven eternally. But that does not dismiss the punishment for doing wrong. Imagine having a family member victimized severely and a judge giving the person who committed the crime pardon simply because he knew the person. How would we feel? That would not be just, and God is just. Have you ever looked past, have you ever been looked past by someone on your job simply because the person bribed your boss when you may have been the one more qualified? Christians don't have to bribe their way to the top. Proverbs 18, 16 says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. So advancing in a career as sons and daughters of God comes as we grow and develop, develop the, God, the gift that God has given us. Those who use bribes will always have people with resentment towards them. Those whose gifts promotes them will be celebrated. 
So as Christ's ambassadors, we are to show no partiality towards others and expect no partiality to be given to us, but rather to be honest and fair and treat everyone equally. Amen? Amen. So this is how we should do it from now on. Everybody's treated equally, and, and we should be treated equally. That's, right. that's, that's what the United States is about. That's what it is about, and that's what yes, we need to maintain. Yeah, we need all, all. I know people that are in, um, from what I heard, I'm um, in uh, masonry and whatever, and if you're a mason and you go to court, you just give a sign and you get out. You get free. You get a walk right out the door, but, you know, those things do happen, but amen. Amen, amen. Let's continue on. We're going to deal with correction now. Proverbs three eleven through 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those who he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Being raised by my grandma... I knew very little discipline. I actually can hardly recall ever being corrected as a child, ever. I wish. (laughs) I was so good. I wasn't that bad, but I wasn't that good. The few times I was corrected as a child, I didn't handle it too well because I wasn't accustomed to it. Yet I find upon knowing Christ, I've grown to welcome correction. My favorite sermons are those that challenge me. And I actually like giving sermons that challenge others because they challenge me at the same time. I am now grateful for individuals such as my wife, who is my biggest fan, yet my biggest critic at the same time. My kids, especially my oldest one, teenager, who loves to point out when they think I'm wrong. And also different members of the body of Christ who correct me in love. Hopefully in love. At first, my reaction was defensive because I didn't grow up with much correction. I would blame others rather than myself. But as Father God has humbled me, I now accept correction as his love working nothing but the best in me. People who don't receive correction won't listen to warnings. And therefore, they can't avoid experiencing the problems that most people their age face. We can be ahead of our time, ahead of our age, if we listen to those who are older than us, when they give us correction and advice. Amen. One reason why my life is so peaceful, and I'm not dealing with a lot of stuff, is because of that. I have very little drama. I'm ahead of where people typically are at my age because I've listened and obeyed the chastisement I've received from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Wish we had some young people in this house that need to hear that. <laughs> but we are young, aren't we? Amen. A little bit. I'm starting to get there. Climbing up those 40s. All right, we got one more for tonight before we go into worship. And this is a really important one considering all that's been going on both here in our home church and throughout the nation with all the deaths, especially in Orlando. And this has to deal with wisdom regarding death. And I think this will be an encouragement. Death throughout Proverbs is used to warn those who have no fear of God that the end will be eternal separation from God called shoal or hell. So death throughout Proverbs is used to warn those who have no fear of God that the end will, the result will be eternal separation from God. The children of God are not to be afraid of death, for it has been swallowed up in Christ. God's children understand that this life is just preparation for the next one. And the next one is a whole lot better. They, we are all, we who are believers, are in training. And upon completion of this life, we are promoted by receiving, first of all, what we're going to love the most, a brand new body. Amen. That's going to be all good. We've, some of our bodies are pretty worn out, but it's not going to be like that forever. The new body we receive cannot get worn out. It's a spirit body. It's perfect body. We'll not get sick. 
We won't get tired. We won't get weary. Perfect body. And then we'll be given a rewarded place of authority to reign with Christ for eternity. So though you might be weary in this time, look ahead at the reward that is to come. Look at the end of the race. There's something great at the end of it. And if we can see that prize at the end, we can get through our temporary, momentary displeasures, discomforts, tests, and trials. In Proverbs 5, 5, 7, 27, and 9, 18, death is a warning to those who allow the lust of the flesh to rule their behavior. It's like climbing downstairs in the devil's house one step at a time, leading closer and closer to eternal damnation. Aren't you glad that we're not going stepping down, but we're now stepping up? Amen. Yes, Isn't it a lot better going up than going down? Sin is described in Proverbs 8.36 as a result of hating God and loving death. It may seem initially right, but it will always turn wrong and bring injury upon oneself. Sin is putting self above others, which will always bring retribution because when you're cruel to others, others will be cruel to you. We reap what we sow. Even when the wicked gain power, they will be eventually overthrown because of all the enemies they have gained from their wicked deeds. While the righteous have the hope and confidence that physical death is not defeat but victory. I read a report even now. You know, ISIS, thank God, ISIS is finally beginning to be, cities are being taken back over. Some of the uh, material that they've been using on the internet has been twisted and turned. Somehow Christians have been able to get, and people are getting, uh, coming to the Lord through it all. So, and yet you're here today. Yep. We, and that's why we've got to pray for our military. We've got to pray and keep on praying and, and pray that, you know, that this, the wickedness in this world will be completely defeated. We know that it will eventually, but even at this time, we want Christ. Oh. Oh. So we thank God for our soldiers. Keep praying for our soldiers. Pray for this gentleman here who has fought for our country. So while those who are lost in sin are climbing down deeper into gloom and death, those who are walking with Christ are stepping upwards from glory to glory into eternal life. So we thank God as a church family that our beloved Rachel Layton, she went up to the ultimate step. She stepped into the final platform. She's there with the king. She's received her crown. She's rejoicing for eternity. We who are left here, what are we doing? We keep on climbing. And people like Rachel and others who go before us, they help because of their witness, their example. They show us, and when they go on, we take their mantle and their example, and we take a little bit for ourselves, and it helps us get past the next hurdle, the next step, so that we can even climb higher. Amen? Amen. 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 So we're going to close with some worship songs.